Emily. And I'm Amelia. We're the co-founders of Wildflower Delivery Co. And today, we're starting with the basics. We wanted to give a simple sewing machine tour and go over the 101s of sewing machine setup, winding a bobbin, threading the machine, and starting a stitch. All machines are slightly different, but it's like driving a car. And once you're comfortable on one, it's pretty easy to transfer the knowledge to the next. So let's jump in. This video starts off with the basics of how the sewing machine actually works. Then we break down the individual components and go over their functions. Then we go over winding the bobbin and threading the machine and finish with a few basic stitches and seams. Feel free to jump ahead to the section you need. First things first, how does the sewing machine actually work? If you've ever picked up a needle and thread and done the classic in out, in out, you are doing a running stitch with a single thread. The secret behind this sewing machine is that they work in a totally different way, using a different kind of stitch and two separate threads. One fed from above by the needle and the larger spool of thread, and the second one fed from below by a reel called the bobbin, which is mounted in a rotating carrier called the shuttle. The needle pushes the thread down through the material, forming a loop, which is caught by the shuttle and looped around the bobbin thread. As the needle pulls the section back up through the material, it pulls both the bobbin thread and the previous stitch taut. So basically, the thread is coming from above and below, and the top thread is, looking, is locking into the bobbin as the machine sews. This kind of automatic stitching with two threads instead of one is called a lock stitch. The sewing machine revolutionized society when it was introduced in 1851 by Isaac Singer, which is the same company as Singer today. It really hasn't changed very much, and honestly, it's still pretty sweet. So let's take a little tour of the sewing machine, its components, and the functions they serve to make this whole process happen. We'll start with the right side of the machine. The plug connects power to the machine and connects the foot pedal to the machine. The pedal sits on the floor and is operated like a car gas pedal, pushing it slowly down to engage the motor. The on-off switch. For most machines, when you flip the machine on, it also turns the sewing light on. Inside this part is where the motor is located. On older machines, the motor is elect electric and powers mechanical gears and cranks. In most newer machines, it's electronic and the machine is controlled with a microchip. This is the hand wheel or the balance wheel. Turning the wheel towards you when you're sitting here engages the same process as the foot pedal, but with no power. So it can be really helpful to use the hand wheel to start your stitch, back stitch, or maneuver a tricky stitch. It's best for the machine to only turn this wheel forwards towards you. It's okay to micro adjust up and down, but if you want the needle to be in a completely different position, do a full turn towards you rather than turning it backwards. Now, on top of the machine, you'll find the bottom winder. You will load an empty bobbin here. The bobbin is the small reel that contributes the bottom thread to the stitch. So pop it on the post and then click the post over to engage the bobbin winder. On some machines, you'll also have to disengage the hand reel to initiate this process. This here is the spool pin. The large spool of thread, which contributes the top thread to the stitch, is loaded here, both when you are winding a bobbin and also when you're sewing. It's held on with this little cap. On some machines, this is oriented horizontally as it is on mine, and on others, it points up vertically. Then we have some dials. These will generally vary more in style and position from machine to machine than the spool and threading sections will. On computerized machines, these are usually part of the computer panel control. This is the stitch width dial. It determines the side to side width of the stitch. For a straight stitch, the wheel stays at zero, but for a zigzag, you can adjust the lateral movement of the needle to make the stitch wider from one to five. The needle position can be changed with this wheel. You'll mostly use the needle in the center position, but for special circumstances, like using a zipper foot, you can move the needle to the right or left. The tension control is here. Tension can feel like a mystery, but essentially the two threads the two thread lock stitch method only works when the tension of the bobbin is balanced with the tension of the top thread. You'll know the balance is off if either the top or bottom thread pulls out really easily from a stitch 
or if the bottom and top side of the seam look really different. Before messing with the tension wheel, I always start by re-threading the whole machine, and if that doesn't fix the problem, then I'll mess with the tension. The wheel indicates a, like a middle zone. For most projects, something in this range will be perfect. And once you find the setting that's right on your machine, you really won't have to adjust it unless you are working with a completely different material or threads of different weights. Over here on the top uh, left of the machine is where the basic threading begins. Now the front side of the machine. This here is the stitch selector wheel. It adjusts the type of stitch. For our kits and in most garment sewing, you really only use a straight stitch, which is here, and a zigzag stitch, which is here. But it can also be fun to experiment with other stitch variations for decorative purposes like quilting. Above the stitch selector is the stitch length regulator. This determines the length of each individual stitch in a row. For regular garment seams, you generally want the length to be between two and three. But for something like a gathering stitch, which needs to be looser, you might want the length at about four. And if you're sewing a tight zigzag to create a dense line of stitching, you would turn the dial to one or zero. This here is the reverse lever. When you press this down, the machine stitches backwards instead of forwards. This is used to back stitch. Next to the reverse level, reverse lever is the um, thread guides where the machine threading continues. We'll get into that in a second. On the machine bed, we have the needle plate, bobbin case, presser foot, needle, and feed dogs. So let's take a closer look. The needle plate is a removable piece that sits over the feed dogs, often has a cover for the bobbin compartment, and has stitch guides marked on it. These guides indicate the seam allowance width when your fabric edge is lined up with the mark and your needle is in the center position. So from the tip of your needle where it penetrates the fabric to the 5 8 inch mark gives you a 5 8 inch seam allowance. My half inch mark isn't actually labeled, but it's the line between the 3 8 inch and the 5 8 inch. And you can also unscrew the needle plate with a screwdriver that usually will come with your machine to access the inside for periodical cleanings. This is the bobbin compartment that houses the bobbin wheel when you are sewing. The bobbin gets loaded into the shuttle under this pop-out trap door. On my machine, it is oriented face up, but on other machines, especially older ones, the bobbin is front loading and is oriented in the machine sideways. Often in those machines, the bobbin case will be a separate removable part of the shuttle and the bobbin is loaded into the case and then popped into the shuttle. On my machine, the bobbin case is fixed inside the shuttle and remains a part of the machine. So I just have to pop the bobbin in, but we'll go over all those specifics in a minute. Here is the presser foot. It is a patchment that extends from the metal shank on the machine arm. The presser foot is essentially the negotiator between the needle and the fabric. A standard foot is designed to make straight stitches easy with long straight edges to help guide the fabric a wide base to keep the fabric flat, and a needle opening that is wide enough to accommodate the needle in various positions. A straight stitch or a zigzag would work with this foot. Another common foot is a zipper foot that is much slimmer and allows the bulk of the zipper to ride right up against the needle, which is something that a wide standard foot isn't good at. On my machine, I have an attachment that quick releases the foot so you can easily interchange them. I can release the foot with this back lever and then click a new one into position by positioning the bar under the arm and lowering the presser foot onto it. You'll hear a click. I can also take the mechanism off with a screwdriver here if I need to use a foot that connects directly to the shank and doesn't have a quick release bar. Most machines come with a few standard feet, but there are super cool specialty feet for all kinds of niche sewing techniques that you can buy. Piping feet, hemming feet, even bias binding feet. The needle is the part of this whole crazy machine that might feel recognizable to most people. Although a machine needle is slightly different than a hand sewing needle. It's, what, it's a wider shaft and is round on three sides and flat on one edge and then tapers to a point on the other end with the threading hole right above the point. The needle gets loaded vertically into the machine with the flat edge facing the back and gets held in snugly with this pin. 
there are different weights to the needles based on the material of sewing. Universal needles for medium weight cottons and linens, heavier duty denim and leather needles for thicker materials, and lightweight needles for delicate, finely woven fabrics like silk twill or chiffon. Underneath the presser foot are the feed dogs. Yes, that is actually what they're called. There are cutouts in the needle plate and you can see these metal bars with little metal teeth on them. The feed dogs help guide the fabric under the needle evenly and straight by simultaneously pushing up and pulling backwards on the underside of the fabric. You'll notice when you start sewing that your hands guide the fabric and keep it steady. But if you sew hands free, the fabric will still move straight through the machine and that is the work of the feed dogs. When you're adjusting the stitch length up here, you're actually adjusting the circuit of the feed dogs. And when you press down on the reverse lever, you're actually engaging the feed dogs to push the fabric forward so that the stitches are placed on the fabric in reverse. You're not affecting the position of the needle whatsoever. Cool, right? The machine bed also has a removable section to expose the inner bed. Often there's a storage compartment in here, and on some machines, you'll find that you access the bobbin through a trapdoor right here. It's helpful to remember that this part can come off when you're stitching around a tight area like having a narrow sleeve. In that case, you would put the sleeve over this inner arm and be able to sew it flat. Just a few more elements to go over and then we'll dive into specifics. On the left side here is the thread snip. If you look closely, it's a tiny protected blade. As you bring your piece out of the machine, after completing a stitch, you can pull the thread down over the thread snip and it clips it. Sometimes this is located directly on the needle plate or on the corner of the machine arm but definitely find it on your machine because it makes sewing so much faster. Looking at the back, you'll see the presser foot lever. This is what brings the foot up and down. The foot needs to be up to install the needle, change the presser feet, and when you place fabric underneath to start a seam or remove it when you've finished a seam. It needs to be in the down position when you start to sew. When the foot is down, it's putting pressure on the fabric and working in concert with the feed dogs to maintain the tension necessary for the stitches to complete properly. When you're first getting used to a sewing machine, it can be easy to forget to put the presser foot down. And without that tension, the stitches become a rat's nest on the back of the fabric. So you'll learn quickly. <laughs> One last thing back here that I don't use very often is the lever to lower the feed dogs completely. Normally as you're sewing, like I mentioned, these little zigzaggy guys come up and grip the underside of the fabric and move it backwards under the needle so that you can make a really even row of stitches. But if you're doing more of a free form stitching, say on a quilt, and you want full control to move the fabric sideways and backwards, you can put these down. Okay, so you have the basic layout of the machine and are introduced to its key components, but where do you start and how do you use it? In your kits, we included standard class 15 size pre-wound bobbins because it's a joy to just jump in and get, right, get started. But some machines take a narrower bobbin size and knowing how to wind a bobbin is critical for future projects. So we'll start there. For most applications, you want a matching thread, both color and thickness for the top spool and the bobbin. So the stitch line looks the same on both sides. So start with a spool of thread in your desired color and an empty bobbin. Now, new spools of thread often have stickers over the top. So start by peeling that off and it'll expose the inner shaft. Our kits come with Guterman 100% polyester thread. This is a high quality brand of thread that is really strong and smooth. Cheaper threads work okay in machines, but they'll tend to break more easily, cause tension issues because they're flimsier and less consistent, and give off lint as the thread is abraded in the sewing project process, which over time gunks up the inner workings of your machine. The Guterman spools have a thread lock on one side to hold the loose end of the thread. I load my spool with the thread lock to the back. This ensures that as the thread is spinning off the spool, it doesn't catch on the bumps of the thread lock. 
And once the spool is on there, I'll use this cap to, to secure it into place. Now, winding the bobbin and threading the machine can feel complicated and intimidating, but almost all machines have numbered guides on them, and the process is quite similar from machine to machine. The spool we just loaded will be in the same position for bobbin winding and sewing. To thread the bobbin winder, first find the bobbin winding tension knob. It'll be in this general vicinity and will have a tension disc that is spring loaded. My machine shows exactly how to thread it. So I'll wind it around and make sure that the thread is being held taut. Now, take your empty bobbin and thread the end of the thread through the slits on the bobbin. Press the bobbin onto the bobbin winder shaft. It'll click into place. Then push the loaded bobbin right towards the stopper. Pushing the bobbin over transitions the motor from engaging the sewing features the needle and the feed dogs to spinning the bobbin winder. So here you see the needle and the feed dogs are working and now once this is pushed over it starts to spin the bobbin. So when the bobbin is pushed over the motor spins the bobbin winder instead. On some machines this control is actually on the hand wheel instead of on the bobbin. So on a machine like that, you would load the bobbin onto the bobbin winder and either unlock the hand wheel or press a button on the side of the hand wheel. To start winding, hold the end of the thread taut and gently press the foot pedal. The bobbin will wind itself evenly and when it's fully wound, the thread will butt up against the stopper automatically, stopping the bobbin from con continuing to turn. Take the fully loaded bobbin and with that in hand, release the plate to access the bobbin case and shuttle. The plate will usually have a diagram showing how to load the bobbin, but a trick that I always use is to hold the bobbin up and make sort of a P shape with the tail coming down off the left side. If it, makes, if it looks like a P, that stands for perfect and you know that it's oriented correctly. So place that P and then place that right down into the shuttle and then slide the tail under the little notch that you'll see in the bobbin case. Your bobbin's loaded. Now my machine and most others have numbered instructions for the threading progression. First, a little hook that stabilizes the thread and directs it towards the thread tension controls. So pop that in there. Second, there's a hooked bar that starts the um, tension progression. So slide that in there. Third, the thread will go through another tension stabilizer. On my machine, this crevice automatically guides the thread into the tension plate, but sometimes this part will be more exposed on the machine. Slide that there. Fourth step brings the thread around a little hook at the bottom and sets it up to feed into the thread take-up lever, which is here. The take-up lever is controlled by the hand wheel, so if it's not visible, you can turn the wheel towards you and it'll pop up in its cycle. So loop the thread around to number four and then pop it up and slide it into the thread take-up lever. Some machines have a hole in the lever that you need to thread the thread through as you would um, like threading the eye of a needle. Bring the thread down and hook it past the two stabilizing bars that help feed the thread directly and smoothly into the eye of the needle. Now, just feed the tip of the thread through the eye of the needle from the front to the back. If the needle is hard to access, you can use the um, hand wheel to adjust it to bring it up higher. Once it's through, use your right hand to hold the excess loop and your left to pull it through. If you just pull the thread, it can sometimes twist and wrap around the point of the needle, so using two hands helps avoid that. 
The very last step in threading is bringing the bobbin thread up. To do this, hold the top thread and turning the hand wheel towards you, you'll rotate that until you see, you'll be holding the um, top thread and you'll see that you've actually extracted a loop of the bobbin thread. So once you have that, you'll pull the tails free, kind of hold them and your machine is ready to go. Last thing is last, I'm gonna put the uh, cap back on the bobbin plate to protect that and our machine is threaded and ready to go. Most of the time, you'll be using the machine to stitch two layers of fabric together, creating a seam. There are many different types of seam, but the most common and versatile is the plain seam. To make this seam, you'll line up two pieces of fabric with the right sides together, which are the bright printed sides facing each other. Then you'll stitch along one edge at a specified distance um, from the edge, which is known as the seam allowance, to join the two pieces of fabric together. Once this is stitched, you can press the seam allowance open and have the joined pieces that have a clean and finished side and a side where the seam allowances are on the inside. So we'll go through making a plain seam with a half inch seam allowance step by step with the sewing machine. You'll start with the two pieces of fabric and face the right sides together. Then you'll line up the cut edges and pin into place. <clears throat> With pinning, you wanna put the pins in perpendicular to the edge so that they're easier to remove while you're sewing. Before we bring the fabric to the machine, we'll quickly go over the settings on the machine and make sure it's properly set up for the seam. So my stitch is set to straight. My stitch length is between three and two. The stitch width is at zero for the straight stitch. My needle position is in the middle. So that's bringing it to center here. And then I've checked that my machine is fully uh, threaded and I have both the top and bottom tails here with a nice about five inch length. And then my presser foot is up and my needle is in the up position. Once you've checked the settings on the machine, you're ready to introduce the fabric. So we're sewing with a half inch seam allowance. So you'll find the mark on the needle plate for a half inch and line up the fabric edge with that. The needle plate has standard measurement guides, but if you find yourself needing a guide that isn't marked, you can always use a piece of tape and mark it on the machine for something, you know, say farther out. Another thing that can be helpful for making straight seams is using a magnet, which will stick to the needle plate and is a kind of acts as a barrier to help keep the seam allowance consistent. So my fabric is lined up with the half inch mark and is about an eighth of an inch back from where the needle will puncture the fabric. I like to start the stitch about an eighth of an inch in from the edge because it's easier to start the needle on a flat um, piece of fabric instead of the edge that could be frayed and not have enough tension to support the needle. Now, I use the back lever um, to set the presser foot down, which will hold the fabric in place. Then my left hand, I'll hold the two tails of the thread and use my right hand to turn the hand wheel towards me, lowering the needle into the fabric. Once I've completed my first full stitch, the threads are locked in and are no longer at risk of getting lost in the shuttle compartment, kind of pulled through and, and disappear. So if you've ever sewn with a needle and thread by hand, you've probably knotted the thread to start and finish. With the sewing machine, you don't need to make knots, but to help stabilize the beginning and ending of the seam, you do back stitch. So I'll take the first forward stitch um, to lock in the tail threads, and then I'll take a stitch backwards to the edge of the fabric, and then continue forwards over those original stitches and on down the seam. This back and forth overlapping fr friction situation is really effective at locking the beginning and the end of the stitches in. So to make the backwards stitches, I'll hold the lever, the reverse lever, 
and this um, will actually change the directional pull of the feed dogs, which will push the fabric forward such that the stitches go backwards. And with the reverse lever pressed down, either with your hand or the foot pedal, make several stitches. Now I'm all the way at the back edge and now I can release the reverse level and re reverse lever and make stitches forward over those original and stitch down the seam. Now you can use your hands to guide the fabric, but you don't want to be pulling it or forcing it. Um, it's really just a very gentle kind of guiding it to keep it straight. Get to the end, make a few backward stitches, and then stitch off the end of the fabric. You'll bring the needle to the up position and then pick the presser foot up, and your fabric should easily pull out. If the threads don't release, use the hand wheel to micro adjust the needle, and that allows the thread to be pulled out easily once it's in the exact right position. By using the thread snip on the machine, you're ensuring that the thread tails are a decent length when you start your next seam. When those tails are too short and you aren't holding on to them, they can easily get lost in the shuttle compartment before they're locked in with the first stitch. Now that the seam is stitched, I'll use my fingers to press open the seam allowances to either side. Then I'll use the iron to press it flat. Here you have a finished simple seam. It's the most basic seam and it really is the building block for all machine sewing. You'll be pretty amazed at what you can make with just this simple stitch. There are so many seam styles and variations, but I'm just gonna dive into one more, a French seam, because it's a personal favorite and we use it in a lot of our projects. So with a plain seam, you have a side that is finished and perfect and then you have the back side, which has the unfinished raw edges of the seam allowance. With a project that's fully lined, like our tote bag, our mask, or our quilted jacket, that's totally fine because the seam allowances are enclosed inside the lining. But with an unlined garment, these open raw edges can start to look really messy, fray in the wash, and be less sturdy over time. Enter the French seam. This seam is so remarkably simple and brilliant and shines in situations with sheer fabrics, lighter weight materials, straight seams, and unlined garments. Essentially, the French seam is a simple seam whose seam allowances are then encased in a second row of stitching so that the raw edges of the seam allowance are hidden from view in a little tunnel. There are two main things to note before you start, finish, start sewing a, a French seam. There are two main things to note before you start sewing a French seam. Your two pieces of fabric start with the right sides facing out. This is opposite to how you started the simple seam, so it's really easy to get on autopilot and forget. In America, we have a sense that French people are stylish and turned out, so if you think of French seams as stylish printed fabric worn on the outside, it'll help you remember. And second, if the seam allowance is a half inch, you're gonna sew the first seam at a quarter inch, and then you're gonna sew the second row at a quarter inch so that the combined make a full half inch seam allowance. So the right sides are facing out, and then the first line of stitching is gonna be at a quarter inch. I'm gonna pin this and take it to the machine. So we'll follow the same procedure as you did with the simple seam, holding the threads, back stitching, and stitching down the edge. But we're starting at a quarter inch.
so with that first seam uh, stitched at a quarter inch, I'll take my um, French seam sample and I'll press it flat. And then I'm going to trim down my quarter inch seam to an eighth of an inch. Normally you would never trim a seam quite so close because it runs the risk of fraying back to the stitch line. But this seam is gonna be completely protected by a second row of stitching and will be and that one will be the one that receives all the stress. So I'm gonna go ahead and clip this. So this is at an eighth of an inch, and now I'm gonna open the fabric and pulling on both sides, I'm gonna press the seam allowance down to one side. You can use the iron here to sort of um, put pressure on the one side, and then I'll pull this side. And pulling this ensures that the seam is getting pressed totally open. So I'll flip this over and make sure that the seam is pressed totally open. And then I'm gonna fold the piece so that the right sides are together and the fabric edge is actually the seam we just stitched. At this stage, as I'm pinning it, I have to make sure that the um, fabric edge, I can see the stitches there. I don't want the stitches to be tucked in at all inside. So as I'm pinning it, I can either use a pin to sort of pick that seam to make sure that it is fully flush, or I can use my finger to kind of press it out and make sure that it's all the way to the edge so that this folded edge represents the, um, the seam. So I'll pin this down. Now, I'm gonna bring this back to the machine and sew a second line of stitching at a quarter of an inch. And trimming down the seam is super important because as I'm stitching this, I don't want the seam allowances to get caught in the channel. I want them to be fully encased in this second line of stitching. So now that this is stitched, I'm gonna open it up and press the seam allowance to one side. In garments, you traditionally press the seam allowance to the back. When I look at this and examine my work, I see the same clean finished front side. And then on the back, Instead of those raw seam allowances, I see this beautifully finished clean seam package that can't fray. I just love it. The last seam variety I'll go over in this video is the zigzag. This is a pretty versatile stitch that we use in a few of our kit projects. Zigzagging the edge of a fabric helps keep it from unraveling. So if you can't use a French seam or finish it in another way, zigzagging is a good option. The zigzag stitch also has some inherent stretch to it which a straight stitch does not. So if you're sewing a knit fabric or joining elastic, the zigzag will enable some stretch. To set up the stitch, find your stitch selection dial and change it to zigzag. Next, you'll need to adjust the stitch width up here. For a straight stitch, this is on zero, which means the needle position stays exactly the same for each successive stitch. But as you increase it higher, the, it increases the lateral distance between the stitches. So a two zigzag would be more of a gentle saw shape and a five or six would be more like piranha teeth. The third factor in setting up the zigzag stitch is adjusting the stitch length. If you're using a zigzag to finish a raw edge, it will help to have these stitches closer together to get a denser stitch, kind of like here. So you might go down to a one or a two. 
If you want a solid bar of stitching, you would go all the way between one and zero, and it would create a dense line of stitching at the width you set on the dial here. Kind of like this bar here. Stitch between zero and one, and the width is a one. Really skinny, dense bar of stitching. Let's jump in and see how it works. So I have a piece here with a simple seam that I wanna finish the edges of. I have pressed the seam allowances out separately so that they can lie flat on either side of the seam. I'm gonna show you two ways to use the zigzag for these edges. First, we can use a medium density zigzag and do a line of stitching next to the seam line fully on the fabric. I'll use a width of three and a length of two. Then, just like you're sewing a normal seam, put the presser foot down, lock in the first stitch, and you can stitch away. This zigzag is acting as sort of a second line of defense against the fraying out, but isn't really cleanly finishing the edge. For the next example, I'll use a wider, denser zigzag and stitch at the very edge of the fabric, creating almost a wrapped edge effect. So I'm gonna put this at a stitch length of about one and a width of five. And then I'm lining up the left side of the needle um, in the fabric, but the right side of the needle um, hits right at the edge of the fabric. So this looks completely different. The um, wider zigzag really like wrapped around the edge and kind of finished that in a fairly clean way. Um, and the difference between these stitches was all just based on the adjusting the dials and um, stitching on the edge versus stitching down the center of the fabric. Now, armed with this, this info, you should be ready to dive into any of our project kits and sew with confidence. Thanks so much for sewing with me today. I hope you had fun and learned a few new sewing skills. I brought Amelia back to show up our completed headband project. Mm -hmm. We love this headband to add a pop of color to a simple outfit or to pair it with a matching print dress for a vintage inspired look. We are Amelia and Emily, the co-founders of Wildflower Delivery Co. And we look forward to sewing with you again soon. Please see the link below to check out our other sewing kits on our website and subscribe to our channel to stay in touch. Goodbye for now.